Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Marrakesh, which has certainly been one of my most anticipated games of the entire year because it is the latest new design from my favorite board game designer of all time, Stefan Feld. Uh, it is no secret that I love Feld's work. Uh, they always just scratch a special itch for both me and my wife. Uh, he's never designed a bad game, period. He's never designed anything other than a stellar design, and this is no exception. This is another great, uh, big, big game, and it's kind of interesting. The last few years, um, Mr. Feld, Herr Feld, has really been focusing more on revisiting his old designs, either you know coming up with new takes, you know, by becoming doing uh, the Tuscany based on Burgundy, doing um, you know uh, smaller versions. Of of Burgundy, and then also doing the other games in the city line, revisiting Bruges and Rialto and Macau and, and some of my all-time favorite designs, and um, you know transplanting them to a new publisher and uh, to a new city in the world and adding new gameplay. I've already covered one. I covered the new updated version of Bruges, which became Hamburg, and I'm looking forward to checking out all the other ones because, again, Feld never fails to impress, never fails to put a smile on my wife's and uh, my face, and this is true too. But the reason I'm so excited about Marrakesh is this is completely completely new. This is not revisiting greatest hits and doing 2.0 versions of them. Although don't get me wrong, I'm super excited about all those too. And you can look forward to me talking about them in future shows. But what has Marrakesh got going on? Well, I was excited going in because to me, on the surface, Marrakesh felt kind of like a marriage between Trajan and Amerigo, two of uh, Herfeld's greatest designs. My wife's two favorite of his designs. Um, you know, Trajan, because you've got these gigantic player boards with, well, Trajan, what was it? There were like five or six different unique activities, almost like different mini games you're trying to balance. In this game, there's like 11 of them. You know, the uh, exploring the desert is very different than entertaining the town people versus engaging in trade versus, you know, trying to impress the Sultan versus, you know, trying to climb the river. I mean, you're really trying to balance what all you're going to do. And so there's a lot of different mini games. Um, you know, again, Kind of that Trajan thing, but Trajan was at its heart driven by a Moncala. Brilliantly so. You know, I mean, actually, Trajan even came with these same little uh, kind of octagonal, oh, what do you call them? Octagonal cylinders, but you did them in a... Uh in, in a Moncala, a brilliant design. One of, many people consider his greatest design of all time, one of the greatest heroes of all time. I don't argue with any of those statements. But here's the deal. Remove the Moncala and bring the cube tower Oh, the sweet, sweet cube tower from Amerigo. And, uh, you know, I love that. You know, of course, the cube tower, Feld did not invent this. In much the same way, he didn't invent the Moncala. He just found cool new ways to use them. In Amerigo, bringing the cube tower in as an action selection mechanism instead of just a way to resolve war like it was originally designed for Shogun and Wallenstein was brilliant. And so I was so excited to see him return to this as an, um, instead of an action selection mechanism, it is a driver of a, uh, of a cube draft. Although it's not cubes. Again, Again, it's cylinders instead of cubes in this game. And, okay, a draft where instead of just pulling things out of a bag to see what everybody gets to draft every turn, we throw stuff into a cube to find out what everybody gets to draft at the end of the, uh, or at the beginning of a turn. And I was super excited for that. And I continue to be super excited for that because it's awesome. We players are the one at the beginning of each turn deciding what's going to go into that tower and what comes out might not be what you expect. Stuff that was stuck in there from before might get knocked out and suddenly, oh my gosh, there's another scholar. I wasn't thinking there were going to be any more scholars this year. Will I be able to get that in the draft? I don't know. Very, very cool. But it breaks my heart to say that um, you know, I have used this cube tower now in a two-player scenario, which means you're dropping six of these cylinders, three for me, three for you. And in the dozens and dozens and dozens of times that I've done tests with this cube tower, only a couple of times has anything ever gotten stuck. And that kind of breaks my heart. It almost makes the cube tower, or cylinder tower now, completely meaningless in a two-player game. Because, here's the thing, if we had all of these as cubes, cubes are much more likely to get stuck on ledges in a tower. These little things, even though they're octagonal, they roll a little bit more easily. And so, what Jen and I found is, we have actually played Marrakesh as a three-player game. Thank you, Leva, for swinging by, because I really wanted to give it a go. And then, in a three, and I'm assuming a four-player game as well, the cube tower really made a big difference. Even if it was only just one thing, every once in a while that got stuck, that changes everything, if that's the thing that you were counting on to come out. Or if the thing that you forgot all about suddenly shows up at the weirdest time. It really makes a big difference. But in the two-player game, the cube tower 
it just doesn't, I don't think, works very well with these cylinders. And it's, it's kind of a shame. It's okay, though, because even if the cube tower wasn't here, the draft where I pick three cubes or cylinders, you pick three, we combine them together, and then we start drafting is implicitly interesting anyway. Although, again, as a two-player game, it's a little luck swingy. You saw in the run-through I did, through pretty much dumb luck, Jen had two rounds where she got twice as many Keshis as I did because we happened to have overlap on those rounds. And when I was lead player, we didn't have overlap, so we got an equal. And that there's no way you can really anticipate that. You can't, you could you could try to memorize everything your player, your opponent has done, but it does make the draft a little bit swingy. Now, I think that's not supposed to matter, of course, because cylinders are supposed to be getting stuck in the tower. But in my experience, with my tower, in a two-player scenario, stuff almost never gets stuck. But it does get stuck in a three- and a four-player game. The other thing is, when we played the three-player game, with three people putting cylinders into the tower, not only are things occasionally getting stuck, but there's the potential for a lot more overlap. A lot more times when, oh, there's three of a given thing, or, you know, two of a given thing. Um, as you saw, and, and so, that mitigates the chance that you see in a two-player game of one player kind of just getting lucky and getting a lot more Keshis than the other player, that kind of goes out the window when the tower works as intended. Now, maybe it's just my tower. I don't know. I am sure the publishers did a lot of testing. Um, and so maybe we just got a bum tower. I triple checked to make sure we put it together correctly. You can't mess it up. It's all color-coded. It's really smartly designed. But this was a problem I had. Now, at the end of the day, I don't mind too much because the draft is still interesting, but as a two-player game, the draft gets a little bit more swingy than it would otherwise be. And then the game starts feeling a little bit more like a game I didn't expect. It starts feeling a little bit like Bruges, where luck of the draw um, can really swing things as you're drawing from blind decks. And that kind of bugged me a little bit. Uh, you know, it's I, I've played every Steffenfeld game that has ever come out. And I have never felt in a Stefan Feld game that when playing as a two-player game with my wife that I was fundamentally missing out on some for some, some element of the experience. Marrakesh, I kind of feel that way. Because of the tower not working as well as it should, and as a result of that, getting a little bit more swingy luck in the terms of the draft. And that kind of breaks my heart a little bit because it slows me down. But still... It's a great design, and I wouldn't have any of these complaints at higher player counts. And also, there's one other really incredibly funky thing about this game, and I mean that in a good way. People often complain with Stefan Feld designs that they are point salads, that it doesn't matter what you do because you'll just get points no matter what. And then they say, oh, well, just do a little bit of everything. That's how you win. A lot of Uwe Rosenberg games get that um, hurled their way too. Uh, people for years, I've been trying to correct people's misassumption about Agricola that to win, you have to do a little bit of everything. That's how you lose, guaranteed. In Agricola, you focus like a laser on a few things. You don't raise every crop. You don't raise every animal on your medieval farm because you have to specialize based on the special powers you get from your occupations and whatnot. So I mention all that because this has always been something in the air. I've heard it said about almost every one of Feld's games. It's a point salad. It doesn't matter what you do. Just do a little bit of everything. It all works out. And it's never been true ever once until Marrakesh. Because here's the crazy thing about this game. You're going to play through three seasons. In each season, you will activate every single space on your board. This is not a game where you can specialize, where you're going to say, no, in this game, you know what? I'm just going to be all about entertaining, exploring, and making dates to picking dates to drive those engines. That's what I'm going to do. In this game, every one of your three seasons, you will pick dates. You will explore. You will entertain. You will um, you know, go to Madrasa. You will go to the palace. You will do all of the stuff. Um, and so, it's kind of like it's, it's saying to all the detractors for over the years, saying, oh yeah? Come at me, bro. You want a point salad? I'll give you a point salad. I'll make sure you do everything in this game. And at first I thought, this is really weird. And I kind of miss that sense of being able to pick and choose and specialize and focus. And I was, I was, I was, you know, the, the I was worried that I was this was gonna be a kind of a downer for me, but then I realized, no. It's brilliant. Yes, you will activate every station on your board three times. And you know, some stations you'll get to activate multiple times because of wild cards and special effects and all kinds of extra bonusy stuff, right? Um, you know, that, that kind of stuff gets in too. Here's the deal. Knowing that I am going to go to the Madrasa at least three times over the course of this game, and potentially more, depending on how bonuses work out, means 
Every time I go there, I have to make a decision. Am I going there for just a quick little pick-me-up and not getting much out of it because I haven't invested? Or am I going there not doing the action and instead investing for something much higher? And this is true for everything. Because all of the spaces, with a few exceptions, um, you want to go to these spaces once you've made a big investment, gotten a lot of your uh, teshis, your, or your keshis, your marikeshi uh, pieces, your cylinders, you want to get a lot of them there and then send your worker because then that's an incredibly powerful turn where you get to do a bunch of stuff. You get to build a lot of walls instead of just spending a whole turn to build one wall. You get to um, get a lot of scrolls all at once. Big ones and little ones instead of just getting one. And the thing is, I know, in say we're in the second season, I definitely got to get that scroll. I have to get that scroll. So do I just go on ahead and put my scroll cache in so I can just do it right off the bat? No. Because I know you and especially if I'm playing a three or four player game, you and you, the other players, you all have to dump your Madrasa Keshis into the tower sooner or later. And what I would rather do is, I would rather wait for you to drop yours in, and then I would like to draft those away from you, put them in there, so then at the end of the season, when I go to the Madrasa, instead of getting like only two scholars, oh, I've got five scholars. Mine plus the two I grabbed from you as well. This layer of timing um, and indirect interaction between players, and remember folks, all the Keshis are hidden. You, Unless you have an eidetic memory, it's going to be hard to remember what players have played, are there still things coming, and I think that's important, because otherwise, oh my gosh, the game would become so analysis paralysis prone. You're like, okay, when are they going to put their, um, when are they going to put their camel out? Because I'd like to go now, but I'd like to get their camel. And they've still got, okay, am I going to wait? Am I going to, you know, all that kind of stuff. It is very, very cool um, trying to make a decision of, you know, right from the get-go, at the beginning of a season, you know you're going to play all 12 of those Keshis over four rounds, three at a time. What order are you going to play them in? May sound like a small, inconsequential thing, but it's everything. And it's really fresh, really different. Now, I would understand why people who just dismiss Feld games as points out to say, what are you talking about? That means nothing. That's so inconsequential. Such a small little thing. But if you're a true Feld fanatic like I am, you hopefully will understand how, no, those little tiny things, just an extra resource here or a resource loss there, compound into huge things. And Marrakesh delivers on that. So that's very, very cool. And it's why my wife loves this game. This might be her third favorite, uh, Feld, now, after Amerigo and Trajan, which this is a combination of. Oh, and by the way, her other favorite Feld game of all time is Bruges. So it's like it's like Feld made this for her, bringing in the random luck of Bruges with the, um, uh, the Tower of Amerigo and the wide variety of stuff you're pursuing in Trajan. And it's, it's great. I was a little disappointed because of the technical issues that made me feel for the first time in any Feld game I ever played like, boy, I really wish I was playing this at a higher player count instead of two. It's still fun. My wife and I, um, we played it once as a three-player game. We played it twice as a two-player game. And then, like I said, I've done a bunch of extra tests on the tower on top of that. We've enjoyed every game, but I definitely enjoyed it more at three. And I have played almost every game in Feld's, um, you know, canon at higher player counts as well. And I generally don't feel like, oh, Macau is so much better. Oh, Burgundy. A lot of times, his games are better at lower player counts. Marrakesh is a different beast. And that's uh, really my main complaint in what is otherwise another great new, really clever, um, and outside-of-the-box design from my favorite designer of all time, Stefan Feld. That's Marrakesh, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.